What's up ladies and gentlemen, Jesse Warden here. We're gonna show local game development style state mutation. And it's where you take a variable and you modify the source of truth. So if you've ever heard of model view controller or any of those design patterns where you separate out your data from the user actually clicking things and kind of orchestrate the two using this controller concept, the OOP developers learned very early on that you have a central source of truth and you control who updates it and when. And it's quite all right to broadcast those updates slowly. If what you see updates slowly, that's okay. But actually changing data, drinking a health potion, updating hit points, those things need to happen immediately. And the only way to do that is have a single source of truth and wrap it with a set of controls to ensure you know who's calling what and when. Now that works okay for small applications, but as it grows larger and you have many different models, it becomes very difficult to control that and maintain and scale that code from a variety of multiple developers working on the same code base. So let's dive into the code and I'll show you some state mutation. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have our standard setup of log is console log. So I don't have to type. We're gonna create a guy named Jester. I didn't even spell that right, did I? Jester XL, that's me. This is my inventory. Think of an inventory as a list of items. And those items have properties. So it's not just something as simple as a string. It could be database records or whatever else. Each is a unique item with a unique property that you care about. In this case, notice we have two of the same things, right? Potion and healing. But there's two. There's one and then there's two. And so these are inventory items, things that I have in my possession, emulating a battle where I get hurt and I use a healing potion to heal myself. Let's use a has a health potion function. To actually heal yourself, you have to verify, do I even have a healing potion? So we're going to create this has a health potion function. It takes in a person, which in this case is this guy, but it could be anybody else. And we look at his inventory. We say, all right, we loop through it, get an item. If this is a type of potion, we don't care what its name is. We just care if its type is potion. Then cool, we got one. Otherwise, false. If we have a health potion, you've got to find a way to remove it. And the way you remove things in JavaScript arrays is the easy way is via splice. It allows you to remove a particular index, in this case right here. And how many items do you want to remove starting at the index? So one. Now you can use it to replace items. We don't care. We're just going to use it to delete a specific index in the array. So again, we search through the array. If we find one that's a potion, we delete it based on whatever person you pass in. When you are building games, whether you're using something like, I don't know, Pixie.js, I guess, which is the most amazing canvas library ever, next to, what's another good one? Um, there's a few of these. So for example, this, this canvas animation library allows you to draw on the canvas and treat it as a series of sprites. So it's a wonderful way of doing it. The things with animation is that they take time. So a lot of times in games, what you'll do is you'll play an animation and when it's done, you'll then update your state of your character or things like that and come back. So in this case, we're going to play a drink animation of a little sprite drinking and it's gonna take about two seconds. When it's done, we'll call the callback. Use a health potion is, if I wanna use it, how does it work? Well, we gotta verify if this person actually has one first. If he or she does, then you can play the animation, and when the animation is complete, go ahead and remove it. Maybe you started drinking, but you were gonna go attack another monster and you changed your mind or something. So it doesn't actually consume the item until you are actually done playing that animation. To get this to work, we have to create some UI or buttons to trigger this whole sequence. So let's go over here to HTML and we will create a button with an on click, which is basically an event handler. So when I click this button or on click, it's an event, I want you to run this function, which is drink potion. And we'll just say drink potion as the text. And then we finally will create that drink potion function I use the old school syntax to verify it's global and everybody can see it. And just to verify we can see it, we'll log out drinking potion. And so you're aware, you can see it, you know, visually in the UI, we'll actually log out Jester's inventory. Done, so we'll go up here and log the person.inventory, which whoever you pass in, for now we only have one person, which is Jester. So look at this UI, we just have a simple button. So we'll click it, we'll see that it's drinking potion, see the inventory with two potions, do the magic function, which is use health potion, gesture XL, sorry, I abbreviated it that way. Now we see the same thing, drinking, but now we see animating. And about a second or so later, two seconds to be exact, we see and done, it removes it, and now we have one. 
So we have two, now we have one. So it successfully removed the potion, very good. So we'll clear this out, click it again. We have one potion, it animates, two seconds later it removes it. Now we have done, fantastic. Now if we try to click it again, it has a check in here to see if you even have it. If it doesn't, it just doesn't do anything. So let's make that a little bit more informative. We'll say log no potions to drink. Clear it out. And then we'll drink starts with two. Clear it. Drink starts with one. And then we've now drink in both. Hit clear. No potions to drink, bro. But we've got a nice little safeguard here. But what happens when I drink this quickly? Let's click it three times and see what happens. One, two, three. So we have two potions and then it removed one. Now we have one. We have one potion removed it, we have none. And now it removed it again. What? What? <laughs> How does that work? How do you drink three potions even though you only started with two? So this is the problem with state and asynchronous coding. This is where OOP developers originally controlled the inputs and immediately set data, but they didn't care about UI updates. So what most OOP developers learned is that this kind of stuff goes here first, and then you really don't care about asynchronous view updates. So you always prioritize model updates. Very, very important. And then you play view stuff later. Let's give it a basic callback that doesn't really do anything just to make it happy. So now if I click it really fast, it will prevent me on the third one from actually doing it and correctly does it. And what we've done is illustrated a problem with mutable state. And that is that everybody points to the same variable and if they try to update it and others try to update it later, they have to be aware of what state it is before they operate in it. So you'll see functions like this that are very, very smart and do things in the correct order to prevent those kind of problems occurring. Now this is easy to do on something as small as this, but as the code base grows and multiple developers attack the same data, even if you're building just a local game with very little async. These kind of things become very, very difficult to spot and mark. Now it's not all bad, as you've seen, if you constantly load all of those particular states of when you edit something and when it's done, we make models always happen fast, changing data, and you make views updated some random point later, as best you can, this is why the observer pattern became very helpful, is that you update data and you broadcast it, if those people want to take their time to respond to that broadcast, good for them. They can update the views later, but at least your data or your source of truth is always intact. And if you have one single source of truth, it makes it simple. Unfortunately, there's two things that often never happen. First, well, really three, depends on your business engagement level. The first is, is that we never really have a single source of truth. There tends to be multiple models. If you look at things like React or Angular or even jQuery, with pieces of data places, you might have multiple sources of truth. And if you're in any type of UI development, your source of truth is actually on the server. It's not really on the client. So unlike games where you can have all that data in RAM and modify it, that data is often on the server. And the last problem is that UIs that don't respond immediately or tend to be viewed down upon. They don't feel responsive. They don't feel fast. They don't feel like they're working very well, right? If they're not very fast. More importantly is that all three of those things combined make keeping that state in your head of when these things change, keeping track of it all. It's really, really hard. You have multiple developers, some of which you are in the same teams and you got to ask them when you update this, am I doing this later? It becomes hard to talk. I hope it gives you an idea today of the sync issues from a mutable state perspective on just simple RAM data and how you have to keep track of that and make sure the order of the operations in normal imperative programming where things are very procedural. If you got any other questions, let me know in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll see y'all tomorrow with some server stuff, cray.